Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, did you see that uh, Jerry Kushner got a New York Times book review for his book? Did you pick up a copy? Uh, I Yes. Uh, I did not pick up a copy of the book, okay. but I definitely picked up that review more than once. <laughs> was that the best review you've ever read? It was uh, like tied for first with a uh, notoriously savage takedown of Guy Fieri's Times Square restaurant. I don't know if you remember that. I remember uh, that. Yeah. I, although in hindsight, I think Guy Fieri is like a very nice yeah, guy. It was, and it was that so person mean. just looks like a huge asshole. Yeah, it was so mean he had to go on like the Today Show I remember the next day to do <laughs> the, cleanup. The you author know? did? No, Guy. Oh. And uh, I will say that he, uh, do you remember we had guest chefs at the mess in the White House? Oh, the, yeah. The carryout window. So the carryout window... You'd get these, you know, guests, kind of B-list celebrity chefs. Sure. And you would never see them. They cook, but it was, it was nice. shot at Sam Cass. Guy worked the, uh, like, the window. Oh, you went to Flavor Country I in went the White to, House. I went to Flavor Country in the wow. White House with Guy. Very nice guy. Very nice guy. So, yeah, I don't know how we tips. got into that, but yeah. I mean, basically just makes a big burger and he loves it. And it looks... The, the food is very large. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a lot <laughs> yeah, of food. Yeah. Uh, we got a great show today in, in top of our, our culinary takes. We're going to cover uh, the latest news on the raid at Mar-a-Lago. These idiotic attacks uh, against our queen, Sana Marin, the, the prime minister of Finland. Yeah. Some reports that Colombia is considering decriminalizing cocaine. A UN report says that forced labor is taking place in China. The presidential election in Brazil, political unrest in Pakistan, uh, Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas makes news in maybe the worst way possible. Yeah, yeah. In the worst place, too. Part of yeah, yeah, we'll explain yeah. why. Wait for it. Uh, Saudi Arabia gives uh, the United States and the entire West the middle finger. Dennis Rodman, French go-karts, dumb God. Starbucks, and Mountain Wi-Fi. What a week. What, what a, a week. week, Ben. Yeah. And then uh, I talk with Max Seddon from the Financial Times about this mysterious bombing outside Moscow over the weekend that killed uh, an ultra-nationalist Russian TV pundit who was the daughter of an influential and very, very frightening uh, Russian philosopher slash like kind of Rasputin cult yeah, leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's really kind of like a genocidal lunatic maniac. And his daughter was, you know, the apple didn't fall far from the tree on that one. Yeah, yeah. and she was on, um, you know, like the Russian propaganda networks yeah. that go 12 hours a yeah, day. This and is whatnot. not a nice person. It's, yeah. uh, it's very interesting. There's lots of theories about who did it, why it happened. Uh, but Max really points us at the response in Russia and the way Vladimir Putin is lifting up this event. I mean, none of us support like the assassination of anybody, let alone someone's kid. But uh, it does seem like Putin wants to use this for as another pretext to do more awful things to Ukraine. All right, Ben, we're going to give the people what they want and give them their uh, their Ray Delago update. <laughs> so the the story has been evolving like yeah. minute by minute. The New York Times says the government has recovered more than 700 pages of classified documents from Trump's country club basement. Uh, last night it said 300 pages, so that keeps ticking up somehow. The Times says the volume helps explain DOJ's sense of urgency and why they did the raid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah say so. 700 pages does that's that to yeah. yeah, it's not yeah, it's an like, accident. It's like war and peace right there. Yeah, that's not Sandy Berger's yeah. sock. That's <laughs> yeah, a, that's yeah. the, it's not fitting in socks. It's yeah. not fitting in a sock. Uh, the Times says DOJ was also worried that Trump and his aides were cavalier with the documents lying about them. They said that Trump himself went through these documents in 2021, sensibly to get classified information out. DOJ is also asking for more security camera footage from the area where they were stored. Apparently, some of the footage they already got shows people moving boxes in and out of the storage room, some documents being moved into different containers. I don't know why you'd be doing that. Uh, courts are also deciding whether or not to release portions of the underlying affidavit used to justify the search warrant. And Trump's lawyers filed a motion asking for something called a special master to be named to essentially weed out documents in the cache that was taken by the FBI that are supposedly covered by attorney client privilege. Lastly, Ben, we talked last week about this suggestion by Cash Patel and other Trump lackeys that he had a standing order to declassify documents when he took them home at night. It was self-evidently ludicrous. Uh, no surprise that 18 former Trump officials said as much to CNN. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, Ben. The more we learn, the more this raid kind of makes sense and seems less extraordinary, especially people who are like moving the documents around in shady ways. I don't know. It's, it's weird. Yeah. I mean, uh, a couple things jump out that are different than what we've talked about in the past with this volume of documents. And I think, I, I guess... I don't know if it's 300 documents or 700 pages. It's like yeah, a bit complicated, but it's a moving target. Look, 700 pages is a lot of pages. I mean, I had eight years of access to classified documents. I had a safe in my office. You were in there. It was a skiff. And I don't think I ever had like 700 pages at the same time, you know? It's a long um, memo. You just don't need all that. And uh, so that's one point. The second point is um, the nature of the documents. I think you can kind of surmise something 
from the fact that there are 700 pages. Um, if it was less, like the most benign explanation I could think of is, you know, these are a few classified transcripts of foreign leader calls, right. or these are, you know, a few memos he had. The love that, letters you know, to Kim Jong-un. You can't, you love letters to Kim Jong-un, yeah, a yeah. few uh, memos he had. No, no, if you're having 700 pages, like these are reports, you know, like these are like multi-page intelligence products uh, that as we've talked about, come from really sensitive uh, sources of collection. And that's the other thing, the handling, what we've learned about the handling and the, the, the rumors that the or reports really, that there are security cameras that show like these are an area of Mar-a-Lago where dudes are kind of wandering around and Just stuff. digging through. Um, you know, one thing we haven't talked about, we've talked a bunch about classified uh, material. You'll remember, Tommy, like even to just take a document out of the White House, let's say, and you're not supposed to take it home. I was I was not allowed to take classified documents home because uh, no. my Screw home that. is not a skiff. It's not secure. Someone could break in and take the documents. Um, but when you would travel, right? So say we're on a foreign trip and we have to go on Air Force One, just to take a report out of the White House on a van to a plane where after you get to where you're going, you're gonna put it in a, in a secure room in the hotel, you have to carry those lock bags. Those lock bags So sucked. these are these like big, heavy, like I don't know what these bags are made out of, but like the thickest possible, you know, material. And then like a, a lock on the top of the bag um, on this like intense zipper, um, you couldn't like cut this thing with like a you know a knife no. you know and um, so they, let's just say they spent four years under those protocols like even though Trump is a mess and you know maybe he's taking stuff back to the residence he's in you follow the, those what, they're seeing the rules like they're seeing you, we had burn bags in our office so at the end of the day you take all the classified documents you print out that you don't need anymore that's what you call your toilet yeah, right? you, you, yeah exactly <laughs> you put it in a bag and some dude in a uniform would come by your office in the middle of the night and pick up this bag and literally burn the literally shit burn you know? it. literally burn it right so uh, like I, it can't be said just how extraordinary it is to just walk out with 700 pages not have them in any kind of secure portable bag, uh, have them lying around Mar-a-Lago. Like, this is just, it's not getting better for Trump. It's getting worse. I just want to push back on this idea that these guys are cavalier with security because Eric Trump posted a photo of himself doing a TV <laughs> yeah, hit yeah. that included the Wi-Fi network name and password for the studio he was in. So I would suggest that the, the documents are in good hands. He he thought it was cool to like, I mean, first of all, just the fact that that guy the password still was thinks, like 112233. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not much that that guy can remember if the numbers get over like four. But, yeah, no, no. Um, he also was taking, I think, a, like a self or not, like some picture of himself doing a TV hit. Yeah, like a Tucker hit or something. Come or on, man. Like, what a it's loser. Not cool. Yeah, it's it, like we get it. You can get booked on television because you're a dad. But yeah, like that, let's just say that the dudes that are <laughs> literally posting their Wi Fi password are not the people I'd want to entrust with the security of <clears throat> sensitive information. Yeah. Uh, I, I think uh, if you've ever watched a movie in your life, you know that there are people that can pick locks. You know, I mean, yeah. come on, guys. Yeah, come on, guys. Uh, okay. Next story. Many of you have probably seen the video circulating of Sana Marin, the Finnish prime minister, dancing and singing with her friends. She is 36 years old. She likes going to music festivals. She likes dance with her friends. She likes other activities that like sentient human beings all seem to enjoy. Uh, Marin was pushed into taking a drug test after this video somehow came out showing her dancing, being a fun, cool person, because her <laughs> critics suggested she was on drugs, which she obviously wasn't. Um, some thoughts on this, Ben. One, obviously this is like just an exponentially bigger story because uh, Sana Marin is a young, attractive woman. Yes. I doubt that a video of, of uh, Olaf Scholz, uh, <laughs> yeah, the chancellor yeah, yeah, of yeah. Germany, yeah, yeah. doing this would get as much coverage. It would get some coverage, though. Olaf Scholz and Justin Trudeau posted on social media a picture of themselves having beers in a bar. Okay. And it didn't, you know, didn't they're not taking well. drug tests. Didn't you know? do numbies. It didn't do numbies. It didn't uh, get not a lot of likes on the, that. There was a story that just came through with the, the, one of the crooked slacks about the new prime minister of Australia, like, slamming a beer at a music festival, and he was cheered so i you know yeah. there, there's clearly some some uh you know unfair unequal treatment here uh two look if i was her i would lock down my social media presence and just not be in videos ever in the future there's a lot of downside no upside but three i actually think most importantly to me it's genuinely harmful if we penalize politicians yes. for being normal yeah. and fun and social. Like there's nothing wrong with going to a music festival or dancing with your friends or having a drink on a Friday night. On the flip side, 
I think it's actually really bad when the only people who get elected are yeah. the people who spend their whole lives like buttoned up, checking the boxes you need to check to get elected, asking everyone to delete photos of them from college, blah, blah, blah. Or like when normal people like Sana Marin get driven out of politics because, you yeah. know, you know, you can get destroyed for like yeah. living your life. This is a really good point. I mean, this really pisses me off. I got to say, I'm, I, I, I'm very angry on behalf of Sana Marin. And uh, it, like, because you're right, like if a 16 year old girl sees this and she's interested in going into politics, she's not going to want to go into politics anymore if she's a totally. normal person, she right? Destroyed. I mean, what were, when I was 36, I think I was going to like your, your group house, you know, that you lived in. Uh, uh, yeah, 1309. Let's just yeah. say some, some things happened in 1309. Whoa, what uh, are we suggesting Fun here? things. No classified documents at Thank 1309. You. Lots um, of, lots of. Some beers. You know, yeah, a lot of beers. I mean, but like, and again, it's not like she was like, you know, ripping lines of cocaine, uh, you know, like no. she was just hanging out, like dancing and like having a, like a, a drink. Like this is normal behavior, people like chill the fuck out and stop creating like a, it's beyond a double standard. This is like a quadruple standard. Yeah. And yeah, like what, what do we want from our leaders? Like we could have Putin who like stages like hockey games where he's allowed to score yeah. 80 goals. He's sober though. So uh, great. What do you think he does by the way in his like billion dollar house, which had like a stripper pole in it, you know, right. um, it did. like uh, we know that there are actual leaders that behave in far worse ways. They just don't do it in public. The fact that she is comfortable having some of this on social media shows that she knows she's not doing anything that's like, you know, illegal or <laughs> like, like this is, I, I, I hate this, these kind of things. You, you know what else doesn't drink? Donald Trump. How'd yeah. that go for all of us? Well, like, like Did the last, our lives? you know, uh, George Bush didn't drink, mm -hmm. um, or he used to, but, um, right. gave it up. I mean, right. yeah, the, 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 like, <laughs> Would you rather be she be sitting there eating a bunch of Big Macs? Like I, I don't know. I don't like it. I just don't like it. I don't like anything. I don't about either. It. I hate the story. The story sucks. She seems young and cool and fun, and it sucks that her approval rating is going to take a beating because you dance with your friends in like an apartment. Who gives a shit? And we talked about this. Like one of the things that is missing in politics these days, and I say in this country too, is just like it should be fun, not grim, yeah. not buttoned up, not angry. Some cool like, leaders. Just some cool fun Obama leaders. Obama was cool. Right? You, you, you wanted to follow him. It and was, he was inspiring. It was fun to work on the 08 campaign because it was fun and he was cool yes. and he was normal yes. and, uh, and and like if you d disqualify those people from politics you're going to end up with some pretty uptight people yep. and uptight people tend to do bad stupid right. things because no, no, they they're so repressed AOC you know? seems fun and young and cool and people think she's attractive and what a surprise that she gets targeted and attacked and became like the number one boogie person for the right well yeah let, like let's be honest about this like you know the well, yeah, it's just it's entirely because of her identity, and that's that sucks. I wish that uh, she had told the people demanding she take a drug test to fuck off. Like, yeah. I, I guess what when, is that about? When you yeah. know you like are gonna pass it, I guess who cares? Why not do it? But I just I hate the precedent. I well, really do. It's it's also really stupid because I mean, like I don't know, Finns. You can at me if you want, but like. I've been up there, like, it seems like people are drinking a lot up there. Mm -hmm. Like, like was she just not allowed to drink like everybody yeah. else is? Like, I, I don't know. I had a lot of beers and when I was in uh, Finland. I had a good time. I've never been. I'm going to check it out. Helsinki, nice city. Yeah. I was there at the White Nights. That was really weird. It was like, like I woke up and I'd had a few too many drinks, mm -hmm. more than Santa Marin had. And I woke up at like four in the morning. It was like bright light in my room. How's this for a transition? Speaking of white knights, uh, <laughs> yeah, Colombia yeah. is considering decriminalizing cocaine. Uh, as we've discussed, Ben, Colombia recently elected its first leftist government, uh, and President Gustavo Petro says it is time to accept that the war on drug has failed and that Colombia should move from prohibition to a government-regulated cocaine market. Uh, Colombia is the largest producer of cocaine in the world, and according to the Washington Post, the source of more than 90% of cocaine seized in the U.S., the White House uh, is not thrilled about this idea. There could be a big impact for Colombia in terms of drug trafficking, coordination and cooperation with the U.S., aid from the U.S. to stop the drug cartels. So I don't know how this would really work in practice. I don't know if the cartels would fight it, right? Because like, yeah. they, want, they don't want their money and their power taken away from them. But it's hard to think of a more objectively true statement than the war on drugs has failed. Yeah. Of course it has. Yeah. That's true in the US, but you know what's really true? Colombia. Fucking Columbia, where yeah. people get yeah. shot. They yeah. literally get killed. Thousands and thousands of innocent people get killed. Because down there, the war on drugs is fought with guns. 
Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, so Not this Reagan ads. Well, and this came up like this. Yeah, the, Nancy yeah, yeah, Reagan. Yeah, remember friggin- those ads? Like, uh, do you remember that when that guy walks in and he finds this kid with drugs and and uh, he's like, "What is this?" And he's like, "You, Dad, I learned it from watching you." <laughs> that is the best yeah, one. Yeah, I learned yeah, it from yeah, watching yeah, you. Yeah, like what? Yeah. That was on for years. Marijuana. Um, yeah, this used to come up at the Summit of the Americas and in Latin America in the Obama years, where other left leaning leaders down there would kind of try to put legalization on the table and the U.S. would always oppose it and we'd leverage. And I didn't like that. I, I was actually like interested, at least in this idea. It's at least worth, talk about it. It's worth talking about because if you like think about the experience of Colombia and the war on drugs. So we basically impose on them their drug laws, right? So we used to make them spray the cocoa fields, which mm-hmm. would then piss off the farmers who would then become potential recruits for the left-wing insurgency, totally. the FARC. Um, we, because we make it illegal, these drug cartels grow and they become totally corrupt force in Colombian politics. So you get like Pablo Escobar, like owning the government. Meanwhile, all the demand for the drugs is from the U.S., right? Yeah. So we like- And uh, all the guns- And all the guns come from the U.S., down. right? Yeah. So yeah. we impose these laws on them and then all this money that flows into Colombia illegally, so it can't be taxed by the government, goes to the cartels who then corrupt the politics and then kill people with the guns that they bought from the United States. Yeah, great system. If I was the Colombian president, of course I would want to look at legalization. And we should try to engage them in a conversation about what that would look like instead of just kind of you know reflexively reaching for our war on drugs frame that is kind of ravaged, you know, huge swaths of Latin America. By the way, I mean, we, we did the uh, the old tablecloth getting yanked out from under the dishes thing to all these countries on marijuana policy, yeah. right? And yeah. now we're just growing it in California, yeah. selling we're it to ourselves, it, feeling yeah. great. Yeah, feeling yeah. really good about it. Big, I'm, look, I'm obviously a big fan of Joe Biden and his administration. I think his views on, on uh, drugs, drugs yeah. are yeah. very well, uh, draconian. Of, yeah, it doesn't get, I mean, th- like, just side note, the, the lack of uh, marijuana legalization and decriminalization you know, it's, it's crazy. It's kind of crazy. I mean, that's why a, would we want to reach a lot of young voters <laughs> yeah, who uh, well, are <laughs> leaving the Democratic why would Party? We want to do something that it would be immensely popular with young voters in the midterm madness, hundred days until the and midterms. self-evidently uh, a good idea, in my opinion. Also, in the in the process, maybe we could regulate some of these edibles. Yeah. So the, you know, yeah, Maureen Dow doesn't get like dropped yeah. on her ass <laughs> yeah. by taking too much in Aspen or whatever. You yeah. Know, we could fix all these problems. Uh, staying in the in the region, Ben. Talking about a neighbor here. Let's talk about Brazil. So we're about six weeks away from the presidential election in Brazil. That will pit President Jair Bolsonaro against the former leftist president, Lula da Silva. Lula has been leading the polls, uh, and many people are worried that Bolsonaro sees this and won't accept the results. Bernie Sanders has been sounding the alarm about this for a while uh, and is reportedly circulating a resolution that says if Bolsonaro loses but tries to stay in power, the U.S. shouldn't even recognize the government or provide any military aid. Very interesting. Uh, there were reports the other day about some Brazilian business leaders, like on a group chat or something, talking about calling for a coup if Lula uh, wins. Bolsonaro's idiot son is saying things like, boy, we can't help it if there's violence, just like Trump couldn't help it if yeah. there was violence after their rigged election in the U.S. Like, hate to see anything happen to you. And they're also saying, like, voting machines can't be trusted, et cetera. So the stakes here could not be bigger. Bolsonaro, he's a right-wing authoritarian. He openly pines for the days of a, a military dictatorship in Brazil. It's a huge economy. It's a huge trade partner. Like, the climate change implications are massive. So, I don't know. It, obviously, it's an election we should watch. The first vote is on October 2nd. No one wins a majority. The next one will be on, a runoff on October 30th. I read about this Bernie Sanders idea coming in. I don't know if you'd heard about it or have any thoughts. Well, I, I think, first of all, this is really worrying for the reasons you cite. It just... In the same way that stuff feels to be like going back in time in other you know, parts of the world, right? Mm-hmm. Like we got a war in Ukraine, we got we got stuff that feels like you know we'd put it behind us happening in lots of places, um, you know, fascism in Europe and Hungary, um, like a, mili- a right wing military dictatorship in Latin America, something we thought we'd left behind. Yeah, and seems bad. if that happened in the biggest country, <laughs> over 200 million people, as you said, with massive Amazon climate implications among many other things, that would be very bad. I think we're seeing that the Trump example does travel, right? And so totally. there's this question of like, are we, you know, just this kind of eccentric, weird, dysfunctional place right now? Or are we kind of connected and stuff that happens here can leap to other places? We've talked a lot on this podcast about how it does. Bolsonaro's language is like, literally, it sounds like Donald Trump. And yeah. he's always been the guy of these kind of, you know, blowhard nationalists who was kind of the most like Trump, 
like yeah. modeled himself the most on Trump. His last campaign, his first campaign, um, drew a lot of uh, messaging and strategy and social media strategy from the example of the 2016 Trump campaign. And now you hear him talking about like rigged elections and bad voting machines and fake well, Remember fraud. Jason Miller and yeah. Trump, Trump goons went down to Brazil to meet with them? I'm sure Trump has probably got an endorsement coming for the guy, you know. So this is bad and this is like Trump and stop the steal stuff traveling to another place, which is embarrassing to see as an American. And yeah, I think that the stakes are so high that we should make clear because what you don't want to get into a situation is Bolsonaro basically tries to steal this election. And, and the question will be, does the military go with him? Because the other thing I'd say is like, why wouldn't he do this? He keeps saying he's going to do I know, it. You know, I like, know. He's been saying for like since the beginning of this campaign, he's never been even close in the polls. We, you know, that's clear. Lula's lead is not close, um, that, that it's rigged. Uh, you should expect him to try to do this. Yeah, the and question is if the institutions follow, do, right? Do the institutions follow? Does military. enough of the military follow? And the U.S. should not fall into a situation where we're like, well, we don't think... You know, we, we, uh, there was fraud, but, you know, there should be invest. No, like if it's obvious that this guy is running a play to just steal an election, we should make clear that our relationship with Brazil is entirely on the table yeah. and, and try to get as many other countries uh, in, the, in the hemisphere to follow suit. The fact, by the way, as we've talked about a lot, that the hemisphere has gone left means it's going to be harder for some right wing guy to to get any support. In Latin That's absolutely America right. I do like that Bernie and Matt Duss and, and that team is mixing it up and kind of pressuring uh, Bolsonaro from DC. Yeah, and I think hopefully he won't be able to use it and twist it and push back. But like, I don't know that anybody knows who. No, Bernie I don't is think so. There. Yeah, the, well, the, the Lula people do, and they like him. Yeah, they love him. Yeah, 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 they, yeah, they do. Lula and Bernie probably like you know been hanging out for, for oh, a few dude. decades, reading like Angles or something. I, I bet right. I bet they were picketing some. Yeah, you yeah. Know, Ooh, farm worker yeah, event labor in organizing. the sixties or something. Yeah, exactly. Which is why we like them both. Yeah. Uh, all right, we're deep in the dark section of the show right now, Ben. So. Get ready. Uh, so the UN Special Rapporteur on Slavery uh, released a report saying that reports of forced labor in Xinjiang province of China, the Western China, are credible. Xinjiang uh, is where the Uyghur Muslim minority has been brutally suppressed uh, and millions have been thrown into concentration camps for quote unquote re-education. This report found that Uyghurs and other ethnic minority groups are likely have been forced to work in agriculture or manufacturing jobs. The Chinese government denies the report. Uh, no one should believe them. But uh, Congress recently passed a bill called the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act that bans the importation of goods from Xinjiang unless companies can prove it wasn't made with forced labor. So I don't know. I just want to flag this one. Truly evil stuff happening in, in Xinjiang. And it really just we've been talking about this for years now. And it seems like the international community has not found any real leverage to pressure China to stop it. No. I mean, it's a good thing they do these reports. I mean, I yeah. know people can say rightly that the UN is fairly toothless, but I mean, who else is going to do a, like a credible report? Like, yeah. I mean, you have human rights organizations and that, that's really important, but it does, I think, matter that something with the kind of implementor of the that's a good oh, the rapporteur? Yeah, the rapporteur, the imperator of the like rapporteur, that. right? I like that a lot. Um, uh, puts this report out. The other thing that I think that the Chinese, from what I hear, and I have to look a bit more into this, um, are, are doing a bit of is they're starting to kind of strategically manufacture things that they know the world needs. Um, oh, good. Like solar panels. Oh, right. That's sort of why yeah. the Biden folks opposed the, it so for a little while. That's right. And the, you know, the Biden folks had this problem because like there's some material that comes from, out of Xinjiang province that is like fundamental to the global yeah. uh, uh, like renewables in, uh, industry. So that's something to watch, too. That's uh, the cynicism of this. But I mean, I think continuing to spotlight it, try to try to isolate and sanction and target, um, obviously, you know, any capacity to profit off of this forced labor. But yeah, it's it's bad stuff. Bad stuff. Th this question, you know, we're, the shift to renewables is going to make uh, getting sorts like rare earth minerals and all sorts of other like, cobalt, lithium, yeah. all yeah. these things for batteries, even more important than ever before. Yeah. And like the Chinese will know how to exploit that. There was a report out of Sierra Leone recently about people passing uh, a law that would require like essentially local okay uh, from citizens there before any sort of mining or manufacturing activity like that happens. It's going to be a big readjustment to see how the US or no, the world really can get access to these rare earths without exploiting the populations and just destroying, you know, local environmental, uh, destroying the communities or like, you know, making them unlivable, basically. Yeah, no, it's, I'm really glad you made this point. Um, the the Russians and the Wagner group uh, go down to Africa and try to control some of these types of resources. Mm -hmm. The Chinese do. And then also there have been some reports recently in places like Congo where, yeah, Congo. you know, uh, you get all these kind of uh, individual 
miners because you can kind of go out by yourself and find cobalt. But then they get totally screwed because yes. they're like yes. they have to sell this to a middleman who sells it up to some corrupt conglomerate, and these people are making like two, three dollars a day, even though what they're mining is worth a lot more than that. Yeah. Like there does need to be some part of the climate transition has got to be putting some regulation around this. You know? For sure. For sure. Um, let's turn to Pakistan, uh, because former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan was charged with terrorism over the weekend, raising fears of political violence in Pakistan. Khan was pushed out of power in April, reportedly because he basically pissed off the Pakistani military, which is very powerful. But he's also blamed his ouster on like a secret American CIA plot to, to push him out, which is... I, yeah. No evidence of that. Yeah. Uh, so these terrorism charges happened after Khan threatened police officers and the judge during a speech. Uh, Khan is a, he's a former Playboy cricket star who is now a populist politician. He's holed up in his hometown. A bunch of his allies have been arrested or basically silenced. But Khan's popularity, as these attacks have come from the government, seems to be growing. His supporters are blocking access to his house, like physically with their bodies, so the government can't arrest him. Uh, he seems, you know, maybe he's, he seems like a couple screws are loose. Yeah, then, a bit but, of a megalomaniacal con uh, yeah, complex. But also the current government is clearly targeting him and his supporters in yeah. an extrajudicial way. Meanwhile, Khan's party is doing better in local elections. So again, like these, these efforts to silence him are backfiring. Pakistan has a long history yeah. of this kind of thing happening and the military and the police getting pulled into political fights in totally inappropriate ways, but it does feel dicey. You, you never once in a while you remind, like, oh yeah, they have like, what, 200 nuclear weapons or something? Yeah. I mean, first of all, there's a few countries where I always wonder, like, we talked about San Marin, but in an even more extreme case, like, why would you want to be the prime minister of Pakistan? Like, you, you basically seem to end up in, in prison. <laughs> you know, everybody kind of ends up getting charged with something. In the same way, like in South Korea, the same thing happens. Mm -hmm. Like, every president seems to go to jail. Um, but, I mean, basically, this is a case where, you know, Imran Khan, for a while, he was in favor with the military. Mm -hmm. You fall out of favor with the military in Pakistan, and this kind of thing ends up get the boot. happening to you. You get the boot. Uh, they, they try to keep the lid on you. And you become more popular because people hate the corrupt military yeah. establishment, right? So this same Tough cycle, cycle plays out. He is like, like, you know, obviously you don't want this to be happening. He, he's not the most sympathetic character either. You know, he, he like, there's a lot of, I mean, even this, the plots of, you know, CIA plot charges and stuff, like, it speaks to kind of like a bit of a narcissism, you know, like, totally. a, you know, like everything is about him, like, like everybody's thinking about him. But um, yeah, to me, this just shows that, Unfortunately, politics in Pakistan has not, you know, uh, evolved in a positive way in the last 10, 20 years. It's the same as it's ever been. Uh, Ayad Akhtar's book was so great in, yeah. in terms of talking, describing yeah. just how conspiratorially minded the Pakistani media and culture can be, too. Yes. Home how you can imagine yeah. folding in this kind of narrative into a simple story of oh, the military yeah. saying, hey, stop messing with us. You're well, out. I mean, and we feed it because, like, when... Um, when you have like you know drones, um, yep. it, it, it's easier to say that the U.S. is behind a bunch of stuff when the U.S. does a bunch of stuff secretly in your country. You know. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, yes. So, uh, different story here about the Palestinian president Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, he made news in the worst possible way last week uh, during a speech in Berlin. Abbas expressed no regret for the attack by Palestinian militants on Israeli athletes in Munich, Germany in 1972. And he said that Israel had committed, quote, 50 holocausts against Palestinians over the years. Again, this was, I think, a press conference with Olaf Scholz, the prime minister of Germany in Germany, where you're not condemning a horrific terrorist attack and talking glibly about the Holocaust. We have been very critical uh, of a lot of Israeli government policies or actions over the years. Uh, and people like Bibi Netanyahu, we've criticized the occupation. But I do think these comments from Abbas are worth highlighting because they are despicable. Uh, and it's worth saying that. And they also just speak to the horrible predicament that the Palestinian people have been stuck in where their ostensible leader is like at best powerless at worst someone who would say insane shit like this which damages his standing damages the yeah. country like makes everybody worse yeah i mean it's a disgusting comment given in the worst place if he believes that uh then he is just like a rabid anti-semite if 
he thinks he's like somehow appealing to some audience he's appealing to like the worst audience in the, the world worst people you in know the like world. far yeah, right yeah. people in europe because he's in europe or whatever um and, and so that you know first and foremost it's just gross um but then your point is so important which is that like this also is like a terrible for the palestinians terrible. right like because you know, you're going to Europe ostensibly. This is a place where Palestinians get a little more support than the U.S. Right. And these are the people that you're probably last remaining sources of or some of your last remaining sources of di diplomatic or development support. And this is what you do. I mean, it, this guy has to go like I, I, he's like 150 years old. Yes. He doesn't do anything. He sits in Ramallah and, you know, does nothing to help his the people around him. Yeah, he's and, street cred because he like hung out with, uh, Arafat, with Arafat in he's Tunisia just like, back yeah, in the day. Yeah, he's still hanging on to like the Arafat mystique. Um, and look, it's just, you know, what, look, whatever you think about the circumstances for the Palestinians, I think everybody should agree. The Palestinians, anybody like who actually wants to see things get better, um, should want new leadership yeah. in the Palestinian. Even progressive people. Israeli leaders who want someone they can actually negotiate with. Well, yeah, and they, done, you know? yeah like, like the far right Israeli leaders are more than happy to have some like useless old guy. Yep. You know, so it's like it just plays into the worst of the status quo. Yeah. Uh, staying in sort of the Gulf here, Ben. I just want to quickly check in yes. on the impact of President Biden's visit to Saudi Arabia, how things are going, how, how they're being as a player on the world stage. Three quick updates. One. The Saudi energy minister said OPEC is preparing to cut oil production yeah. because oil prices are dropping too much. So they did not increase production. Yes. They're going to cut it. Two, a Saudi dental hygienist and mother of two was sentenced to 34 years in prison for sending what appear to be like pretty benign tweets about Saudi Arabia's human rights record. Yeah. Three, Saudi Arabia has executed 120 people in the first six months of 2022 double the total number of executions from last year, despite promises to reduce capital punishment. I will say uh, we need to uh, look in the mirror here when it comes to horrific uh, executions and capital punishment because the U.S. is bad, but that is a god-awful number. So, Ben, seems like that fist bump solves a lot of problems. Yeah, I mean, I think that the people that, like, uh, were most annoying in the run-up to the visit, uh, the the fist bump visit, mm -hmm. were all the people who wrote, like, the op-ed pieces about, like, well, if you understood real politique, yeah. you know... If, this if, is where the real you know, men get serious. Okay, like, idealists, you know, like, you think you live in this world where you can not deal with a dictator like Mohammed bin Salman, but we understand that in the real world, you have to go deal with him because he's going to do things like lower the price of oil, increase production, blah, blah, blah. Machine gun the ceiling while yelling at his mom. <laughs> yeah, well, that was all bullshit. Like, the, these arguments about real politique are, are absolute bullshit to cover up people that just kind of like to be on the take from the Saudis, right? I mean, they, they're literally working against the goal of lowering oil, oil prices, which are down, as we talked about, because demand in China is way down because they have a crazy COVID zero policy, not because anything Saudi Arabia did. So that's the first thing, to just put a pin in the real politique crowd. And then... If the real Paul T crowd, uh, uh, there's some overlap to the people who like to say that, oh, you know, he's actually done some good things on women's rights, right? So part mm -hmm. of what you've heard yes. is, uh, like, well, you know, he may kill a bunch of people and, you know, shoot up the room with his mom and, let women drive. and kill journalists, but he let some women drive. Well, he also just locked a woman up for 34 years for tweeting. So maybe hold the hot moder modernizer takes uh, while you're at it, too. I mean, it is what it is. It is what it looks like, which is uh, like a brutal dictatorship run by a trillionaire megalomaniac. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, a couple, few, uh, few more quicker ones uh, before we get the interview. So we've talked many times about uh, WNBA star Brittany Griner, her detention in Russia and efforts to get her home. Now, former NBA player Dennis Rodman says he is going to Russia to convince Putin to release her. Some listeners might remember that Rodman had a friendship with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. He visited North Korea a bunch of times. Uh, NBC News had a story about Rodman and this uh, going to Russia, and it said, uh, Rodman called Putin cool after a 2014 trip to Russia. So I guess that's your credential. Uh, you will be shocked to learn, Ben, that Biden's team thinks that this trip is a bad idea and is more likely to hurt than help. It seems like there's a non-zero chance uh, that Rodman could get himself in some trouble, yeah, yeah. if you ask me. Yeah. Uh, also, just Ben, like, I just want to say, Dennis, like, if you're listening, buddy, you're not Michael Jordan. No. You are not the guy 
who we pass the rock to at yep. the end of the game and yeah. you put it on your back and you win, you're a rebounder. Yeah, you hit the boards, man. Right? Uh, Maybe the best yeah. ever. It's like, play some team ball here. Yeah, I, well, this is, you know, you and I usually are like, try whatever it takes, throw whatever against the wall and see if it sticks to get people out. This I would not put in that category. Yeah. It's one thing if like Bill Richardson goes over there. Um, I mean, I mean, Rodman, because like I don't see any scenario where Dennis Rodman <laughs> goes to Russia and then Vladimir Putin lets Brittany Griner leave on a plane with him, right? With nothing, because yeah. Rodman can't offer anything. Yeah, he's not like he's Maybe taking. Him some like balls. A, he's going to negotiate a spy swap over there, right? Uh, or a prisoner swap, um, and and then you can also see a scenario where okay, he could go and just kind of nothing happens, but you could see some weird scenario where like. Like there's some photo op with Putin, and he's kind of making fun of us. You know what I mean? Like, because like Robin's this kind of weird dude, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I could see Putin using this in some, you know, it's not like it's a important way, but just like trolly. Oh, way. the most cynical you know? way possible. The most cynical troll like yeah. way possible. Yeah, Robin will probably get her out, and we'll look stupid. But you know what? I'd love you to know look what? stupid. I'd love to eat my words on this. I one. I will yeah. eat yeah. the shit out of those words. Yeah. Um, Ben, have you ever seen uh, Sting in Russia? Have you ever seen the Nathan for You episode where he opens dumb Starbucks? No. The real version happening in Moscow, there was an old Starbucks. It was shut down because Starbucks got out of Russia after the invasion of Ukraine. The Russians reopened it with a new owner, a Russian owner, apparently some another rapper, uh, with nearly identical branding, but it's just called Stars Coffee. And on the Stars Coffee website, they said, Bucks left, stars have stayed. So... You showed us. Do you think it's like the full uh, gamut, though? Well, like, can they get the, like those like bottled frappuccinos and stuff? I mean, apparently or are they they're just selling coffee. Apparently, they're selling booze, so they might have. I mean, might be a real upgrade. Yeah, the, maybe that's that's actually not a bad idea. It is a good test of how much that logo has been responsible for the Starbucks success, because it's quite a you know, it's a logo that makes you want to go in and get a cup of coffee. Yeah, wait till we sanction the shit out of like all coffee beans for no <laughs> yeah, reason or yeah. something. Uh, this is a fun one out of France. The French Justice Ministry is taking some heat after inmates at the country's second largest prison were allowed to participate in like a festival of games that included go-karting and other games modeled after uh, a French reality show. Uh, There's a video of this event, a competition, whatever you want to call it. It was hosted in the prison yard and it wound up on YouTube. The Justice Minister, whose name I believe is Eric Dupont Moretti, called the video shocking. Um, (laughs) I watched the clip then and it looked fun as hell. Yeah. This guy was just tearing ass around the, the prison yard. Uh, Le Figaro reported that this event was approved at the highest levels of the justice ministry, but not the go-karting specifically. Prisoners raised 1,700 euros for charity, and the French officials said no prisoners involved in the games have been convicted of like violent crimes, like no rapists, no murderers, uh, and there was no cost to taxpayers. So, I don't I mean, know, man. What's the problem? I think it's I mean, the dumbest scandal I've yeah. ever heard. Well, do you notice this, like, in some of these European countries... Um, you know, their scandals are so quaint compared to ours. Mm-hmm. You know, like we've got like a former president with like 700 pages of classified documents who tried to overthrow democracy in a violent insurrection. And they're like, you know, reading Le Figaro about <laughs> go-kart racing in and some, in some nonviolent offenders prison. Yeah, that look, sounds fine to me. Look, admittedly, if someone like beat the shit out of me and took my money and then I saw him like go-karting around prison, I might be annoyed. Well, but it's not like... He's no, raising money for charity, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, it's not like every other day is a good time in prison. Yeah, yeah. Also, yeah. God forbid that like, I don't know, in the US, I think prisons abroad are generally a better, nicer. at least They're in Europe. Nicer, yeah, yeah. We throw people into prison. We treat them like animals yeah, for yeah. years, usually yeah. for drug we charges. radicalize them. Yeah. yeah, and we expect them to come out yeah. and like re-emerge reformed or with some humanity. No, like let them cart. Just to, to merge dreams here too, like there are not as many people in those prisons in France because they don't lock you up for life for like small petty drug offenses. Yeah, three strikes you're out. So drug again, decriminalize uh, marijuana for a start. There we go. Uh, last story. Uh, I wanted to mock this one, but halfway through I decided I was wrong. Mount Kilimanjaro, tallest mountain in Africa, is installing Wi-Fi so you can post stuff when you get to the top. You can get service right now at 20, uh, 12,200 feet and it will be available at the 19,300 foot summit by the end of the year. Some of these reports were framed as like, hey, uh, now you can post your selfie from the summit, you like vapid Instagram obsessed narcissist. Yeah, And that's true. Uh, there's obviously like a safety component. It'd probably be good to be able to communicate if you got like really sick. Um, I did not know that there's also Wi-Fi and broadband at Mount Everest. It has been for a while, I think it's more like 3G, 4G kind of stuff. Um, the valid criticism is yeah. that Tanzania is installing internet on Kilimanjaro That's for tourists, go. yeah, yeah. but half the country doesn't have yeah. cell phone reception. Yeah. But uh, Ben, 
guess who is helping build out Tanzania's fiber optic network? Uh, I was going to guess like Elon Musk, but the Chinese, the Chinese. Okay, it was Elon Musk or the Chinese. Yeah, the Starlink thing would be helpful. Yeah, I think they would. Uh, uh, quite possible that Chinese like there's some strings attached to that in terms of their access to data. That's my guess too. <laughs> but um, did you ever read the Snows of Kilimanjaro? No, the Hemingway story. Well, like that's what happens. They get sick on the mountain and they can't. You know, they so like actually the Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi would have been good for Hemingway, you know. Um, but yeah, like it, it does speak to a big, bigger issue, which is that in in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in part because there's not a lot of in some of these places, there's not a lot of kind of physical infrastructure, like you know, phone lines, towers, computers, so. towers. Um, everything like has shifted to phones, right? So there's like mobile pay, mobile right, everything, you kind of right? Leap that step, yeah. And and that's a reason to try to expand as much as possible. And it's not that expensive. Um, right. it, it would be an interesting development finance priority for the US. Um, we've worked a bit on like increasing access to power and electricity in Africa. Like maybe we can help wire Kilimanjaro and like or it. you know, the places where people actually live and not just sure. you know, tourists yeah, hiking cities. and yeah. You know. Hemingway would have been good on Twitter with those short pithy short, sentences. Short and clear, but also they, they might have been He would have been cancelled like that. He would have been, he would have been canceled. <laughs> and they Stick also a fork in that guy. like you know you know how he like kinda of leaves things out? Some of them might have been kind of interestingly opaque, like today I'm feeling quite fine in the cool air and like nobody knows why, yeah. you know, or something. Um, it was just like a lame Twitter. Yeah, it'd be a good someone should have like a Hemingway account, you know. Was he a cocaine guy? No, just I think just booze. Just, just booze. a lot of booze. Just hanging out yeah. in like Cuba. Pound and booze. I one of the coolest things I got to do is I got to go to that house when I after I did the Cuban negotiations. How big was it? The Cubans knew I was like a big Hemingway fan, so they you know this is like what they can do. Like I got a private tour of Hemingway's house. Cool. It's like the coolest house, but it's like a house like designed for like drinking. Okay. You know, there's like how so? Tell me more. Like no a, stairs. <laughs> there's like you know like the place where he works is next to the place where his books are, and then it opens in this huge veranda where you can kind of just tell. And there's like like animal heads on the wall. Huh. It's like a lodgy kind of feel, and um, uh, and they preserved it exactly as when he was there. There's a swimming pool where they used to have like wild parties and like Hollywood what? actresses would come down and swim in this pool. And then his boat is there and that he used to take out for like benders on the water. Really? It's, it's very cool. Like check out the Hemingway House if you ever go to Havana. God, I, I we just it. fix the stupid Unfortunately, Cuba you're policy. not allowed to travel to Cuba just, <laughs> unless uh... you have some like educational purpose. And, you know, so well, yeah. that sounds like one. Sounds like it'd be good to go down to Heming Hemingway House and check come it out. Come on. Yeah. We did it, Joe. Yeah. Just fix that part. We did it, Joe. Legalize drugs and let people travel to Cuba. And stop talking to and Mom And don't talk and to Mom and Salman. Three solid recommendations to emerge from this right. uh, podcast. That's great. Uh, okay. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, you will hear from the Moscow editor of the Financial Times, Max Seddon. We're going to talk about this car bomb in Russia that exploded over the weekend, killed a woman named Daria Dugina, the daughter of a propagandist, propagandist herself. We'll also talk about sort of the general state of play six months into the war effort. So stick around for that. I am so excited to welcome back to the show, the Moscow editor for the Financial Times, Max Seddon. Max, it's so great to see you. How are you doing? Never a dull moment. Well, let's start you know, with a story that, that you've been reporting on from Russia, which was over the weekend, there was this car bombing near Moscow, I believe, that killed a woman named uh, Daria Dugina. Uh, a lot of people believe this assassination attempt was actually targeting her father, Alexander Dugin. Can you just sort of give us a, a quick overview of who these two are? So Alexander Dugin is a name that may may be familiar to, to some of you. He's, he's a philosopher and a irredentist uh, nationalist ideologue who is uh, believed to have influenced some of the thinking underpinning um, Putin's invasion of, of Ukraine. He started out in, in the Soviet period in this bohemian dissident scene of uh, writers. He, he became a big uh, a Heidegger fan, was, was uh, this, this, this self-taught uh, philosopher, and then um, wound, wound up developing uh, these, these uh, you know, both links with the European New Right. You know, those of you who are into that stuff will have heard of, uh, you know, thinkers like the French writer, you know, Alain de Bonnoist. You know, he, he was... Uh, 
uh, corresponding with them. And uh, then then uh, gradually he he started uh, um, winning, winning some fans in uh, the Russian army and security services. So he wrote this um, this uh, book in 1997 that was on the syllabus of the uh, Russian army general staff, uh, the the officers training course. He, he appears to have some degree of influence over the thinking of you know Putin and the other uh, ex ex KGB officers around him who you know have been planning and carrying out the the invasion. So basically, uh, it's it's a sort of postmodern take on on imperialism where you know he argues that that Russia needs needs to uh, be be the geopolitical counterpoint to the U.S. and uh, and uh, reclaim control over its uh, historic lands, you know, particularly Ukraine, and that and that um, U- Ukraine is is uh, you know some sort of dangerous threat. So if you if you look at you know the uh, the, the way that he's written about in the press, uh, there's a sort of indication that he was his close advisor to Putin. Uh, there there there's no indication that they've ever met. Uh, he he was always extremely coy about this, including when I interviewed him once and uh, would never give an answer either way. I always suspected that the reason was because the truthful answer would be no uh, right. to have never met right. Putin. But what was definitely true was he would see uh, officials, uh, you know, senior officials like Nikolai Patrushev, who's uh, you know, one of, you know Putin's maybe closest ally, the the head of the Security Council. They they would repeat a lot of ideas that came from fairly obscure points in in Dugan's philosophy, like like the notion of the world island which which is uh, a a big part of uh, eurasianism which is you know the sort of umbrella that dugan uh groups a lot of his his thinking under and and so and so what what changed in russia you know the, you know even if he wasn't you know necessarily hanging out with with putin you know all day or indeed at all uh what changed was he was saying the sort of things that you know by and large you know became more and more the political mainstream in russia and um uh, it, it was remarkable when when you read uh, the uh, the five thousand word essay that Putin wrote last mm-hmm. last summer that was basically his manifesto for for invading Ukraine based off of his own historical research and uh, you know some some weird books that he'd been reading that are well outside the Russian historical mainstream. You know, it it almost read read like Dugan could have could have written it, and you know Dugan would have taken that as a huge compliment. Yeah, Max, this is um, an aside that is not the most astute point. I was a philosophy major in college. And I think that anyone who gets into Heidegger uh, on their own is a sociopath. And uh, you probably shouldn't do that because that shit is dense and very, very impenetrable and difficult. I mean, I would describe, like jokes aside, I would describe a lot of Dugin and Dugina's comments, his daughter's comments as, as genocidal when it comes to Ukraine. I mean, didn't he get fired from university job for talking about the need to kill Ukrainians? Um, I mean, we'll, we'll talk in a minute about sort of his his response to this assassination and the things he's calling for. But I mean, it, it doesn't sound like he thinks that that Ukraine should exist in any way, shape or form. No, no. Something I think that's important to, to remember, uh, you know, I, I had discussion with one of my editors the other day where I said, you know, this is, you know, gonna, I, I said, yeah, this is going to give ammo to the sort of ultra, um, ultra nationalist Russian elite who thinks that Putin should retaliate more against Ukraine. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, well, what's he going to do? Invade it, bomb it, you know, throw some missiles at it, uh, you know, torture, torture, rape and murder people. <laughs> and I think I think it's it's, uh, you know, maybe difficult to picture that, you know, this constituency exists uh, in, in Russia. But, but really, it always has. You know, there's there's some parts of the Russian elite who very much like, even though they might have supported the war at the beginning, they thought they were going to have an easier time of it than they are. And uh, they they very much like it to be to be over and to get on with their lives. And there are other parts of the elite. And this is the sort of circles that, that Dugan and uh, Dugan and his daughter were were in um that um actually want want him to go further and if you if you think about it it actually does make a difference but because you know how much do you or did you did you know do you destroy ukraine do you destroy part of it you know do you kill you know a hundred thousand people or do you kill a million people do you annex some of it or do you annex all of it do you allow uh some some sort of rump uh western ukrainian state to exist once you've captured everything east of the Dnieper river or do you 
you just basically completely wipe it off off the map. And um, so so do again these these um, um, the, the way you have to I have to understand these 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 thinkers is that you know they they're used by the Kremlin you know when when there is you know the most the, you know the most use for them. It's not like you know the, the Putin necessarily read you know he may have read something that Dugan wrote uh, and and decided to invade Ukraine. But these things are useful justifications. There's this guy Fabrizio Fengi who just wrote a book about the, this political party that, that Dugan co-founded with uh, Eduard Limonov, the the famous uh, Soviet dissident writer. Uh, some some listeners might have heard of. Uh, he and he, he made an interesting point. He was once um, interviewing one of Dugan's uh, top, top deputies, and he said, "Well, you know how we influence the Kremlin. It's you know uh, we we don't just write you know one article about some topic. We write a hundred articles, and we you know spam the internet. So in Putin's lazy speechwriters, they they Google you know what is this geopolitical issue? They're the you know, all the top search results are you know Duganite articles, and that's that's how they worm their ideas." Into, into the mainstream. And uh, so there was a point where, um, you know, in 2014, uh, Russia annexed Crimea, and then they started the the, the slow burning war in, in the Donbass in Eastern Ukraine. And there was a while where it looked like they they might um, annex it as well. There were, you know, a lot of uh, Dugan buddies who were very heavily involved in that, you know, chief among them, Konstantin Malafeyev, the uh, Orthodox Christian oligarch. And uh, at some point, they evidently decided they weren't going to do that. And uh, you you saw some of these people like Dugan or Alexander Prakhanov, who will be familiar to readers of David Remnick's Lenin's Tomb. They, they've been on state TV a lot. And then they suddenly vanished. Dugan had this teaching position at Moscow State University. And uh, he, he lost that after he said that uh, Russia needed to kill, kill, kill Ukrainians. And uh, they you know, disposed of that idea. But you know now, now it's very much, you know, Back, back closer in the mainstream and um I uh, you should ask me a question first but we if you if you look at you know Daria you know the reaction to Daria Dugan's death uh you know she uh you know compared you know compared to her father you know, her her father was still a fairly marginal figure in in Russia you know certainly not a household name even if if he did have you know some influence and uh, a pretty pretty big reputation outside Russia you know she she was much less known than than him and only really at the beginning of her career she was only 29 years old and uh, they they very much could have you know let this one go go under the rug. And uh, the fact that they haven't done that, they effectively gave her a state funeral uh, today. We're we're speaking on Tuesday in uh, the the TV tower uh, in in Moscow, the Astankan Tower, where most of uh, state TV is broadcast from. And uh, Putin gave her. You know, the, 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 there's no evidence that you know Putin had ever communicated with the Dugans in any way uh, before before Monday when when Putin sent sent uh, her her parents. Say a telegram, and he gave her the 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 order of of courage, which is one of the highest Russian state awards, posthumously. So um, Russia, the the, the the fact that Russia has you know started doing this, it certainly do, does indicate that you know there there isn't really appetite for for backing down against Ukraine. If anything, uh, this has given a lot of fuel to the constituency in Russia that want to ramp things up even more against Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, listen, so Dugan's statement said, our hearts yearn for more than just revenge or retribution. It's too small, not the Russian style. We only need our victory. My daughter laid her maiden life on its altar. So win, please. He also blamed the attack on the Nazi Ukrainian regime. I mean, just as a technical matter, it, it is true to say that, you know, Dugan's also calling for to put the whole country on war footing. Thus far, Putin has still clung to this idea that this is a special military operation. He has not called up all the troops or whatever the sort of technical thing uh, he would need to do to have even more troops at his disposal. So, I mean, if you were going to sort of argue this is a pretext, OK, maybe it's a pretext to take that step. I don't know. I'm, I'm obviously speculating here. I don't want to speculate too much because, uh, I mean, unless unless you're the sort of person who really trusts what you hear from uh, the FSB, uh, we, no. we are unlikely to know any anytime soon. You can make you know fairly compelling arguments in either directions. So, you know, Ukraine has shown recently that it does have capacity to, to do attacks. Uh, behind behind enemy lines, there's um, been uh, in in places like uh, Militopol and then Kherson and uh, other you know, bits of southern Ukraine currently occupied by by Russia. There there have been you know bombings and uh, attacks and poisonings of. Um, 
uh, some some collaborationist officials, you know, Ukrainians who are now working with the Russian occupation authorities in uh, the the Donbas and eastern Ukraine, you know, the the you know the part that's controlled by by Russia. You know, a number of of bombings over the years of uh, the separatist leaders, uh, and and uh, there's always been various finger pointing about whether the Russians or the Ukrainians could have done it. But uh, you know, what's what's um. You, you you could equally make the argument that this might have been some some sort of uh, you know Rus- Russian false flag for whatever reason. Um, right. I don't need to remind listeners of uh, you know Russia Russia's history with with the assassinations. The issue is is that you know some students of history may may be familiar with the murder of uh, Sergei Kirov, who was uh, one one of Stalin's closest allies in uh, the the Bolshevik Party. Uh, it was you know obviously decades and decades before there was uh, anything like evidence uh, as to who killed him. This is still a matter debated by by historians. But what was really significant was how the Soviet Union used the murder, and this is generally accepted as the event that uh, set into motion the start of the Great Terror, when, when millions of people were killed, uh, and and millions more sent sent to the Gulag. And I think that's what's significant here, because uh, they they could have uh, you know swept this under the rug. If you look at some other you know high profile political murders, you know Anna Politkovskaya, what you know sixteen years ago she was murdered, and uh, still still waiting for the results of that one. Uh, Boris himself. Uh, you know, seven years, you know, still nothing on who ordered that. But uh, the FSB claimed to have solved this one within 24 hours. And uh, their their version is just, is just completely ridiculous because it, it follows that, you know, the woman they're accusing of uh, carrying out the attack uh, you know, is is someone who is, you know, uh, according to the FSB, serving in the Ukrainian National Guard. Uh, her info is already all over the Internet, you know, on uh, very various, you know, Russian hacker databases uh, that you don't even need the dark web to to access. Uh, and that she uh, drove drove into Russia, was interrogated. They they followed her on, you know, the video cameras that are all uh, over over Russia. They and they released, you know, footage footage of this, you know, her supposedly entering uh, the same same apartment building where where you're going to live. Uh, no, no footage of her, you know, actually connected to the crime. And then, and then uh, after having uh, supposedly committed it, uh, she she drove back uh, uh, to, to the border, which uh, I've done. It takes like, twelve hours just to get there. It's pretty far. Uh, with with Estonia, uh, was was interrogated again, and they let her through, you know, in in her Mini Cooper. And uh, you know, the the idea that you know they could have, you know, they could have, you know, let this happen and then, you know, solved it so easily. Ah, oh, we missed it. You know, why would we think of that? Yeah. It, it just beggars belief. But, but, but what's really important, again, is if you if you look at the funeral, um, I think it, w- it was really indicative of a process that uh, has been happening generally with, with regards to the war is is that, you know, this this is the first time there's really been, you know, blowback against anyone in the elite uh, from from the war. You know, there were people, you know, you could go to, you know, Donbass or, or itself and, 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 and get shot at or killed. Uh, there's obviously been a lot of economic blowback over the sanctions but the but in in moscow life has largely gone gone along as normal for these people and the idea that you can be blown up you know in in one of the toniest suburbs uh west west of moscow is is really shocking to to a lot of these people and they all know each other you know it's a small town uh you know daria dugano is on state tv a fair bit you know they all run into each other in the green room these shows go on for 12 hours a day these days so you know, <laughs> That they need the speakers, and uh, what 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 you're seeing is that uh, a lot of people in the Russian elite, you know, the sort of ultra nationalist constituency, they're really losing their shame, and uh, people who uh, for years denied that Russia had anything to do with uh, various uh, nefarious acts they were accused of, now they're just kind of casually admitting it. So you look yeah. at you know, Evgeny Prigozhin was there, uh, a man who uh, had you know is is in charge. Of, you know the Wagner mercenary group that uh, denied its own existence, and now is you know advertising uh, pretty openly. It's got billboards in Russia advertising, you know, recruiting people on the internet. Rogozhin has there been some Russian media reports. They even went to prisons himself to try to recruit prisoners to go fight in the war in Ukraine. There he is posing for the cameras at the funeral with a uh, Hero of Russia uh, medal on his chest. You know, Russia's uh, highest state award of them all. You have Margarita Semenyan, the editor of RT, where Daria Dugina would uh, sometimes appear. And uh, she's saying, oh, uh, you know, the supposed killers have gone to Estonia. If Estonia doesn't extradite them, 
then then uh, you know she made this joke about uh, the, the you know her own famous interview with the Salisbury poisoning suspects. We should send some professionals to go and admire the spires and just kind of you know casually drop so like oh yeah yeah we did poison you know the script house with right right with with a nerve agent and um, yeah it's 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 like there's no point pretending anymore because you know almost no one bats an eyelid because it's like oh, oh yeah of course yeah we have uh, uh, a, a shadowy mercenary group that commits war crimes of course we we we, we, we poison these people and um, you know the the masks are off as it were I mean there's no point pretending anymore at this stage when when you're you know this deep into the war and when Russia you know there have been a lot of casualties a lot of you know military losses and a lot of uh, economic damage uh for a lot of people the natural re- reaction is not to say uncool it's to double down yeah I mean so just to sort of button this one up I mean the Russians blamed Ukrainian for this attack on Dugina the Ukrainians said no this was staged as a pretext for an assault on uh, Independence Day which is coming up on Wednesday and then we have this former Russian member of parliament who got kicked out of parliament for opposing Putin I think he now lives in Ukraine uh, he says a group of Russians that we're calling the National Republican Army were behind the attack they're sort of I guess a dissident group is there any way to vet or understand this final claim that there's a new group that is like, I mean, Russians who are anti-Putin within Russia, is that sort of the, the gist? Well, uh, for, for a start to vet it, we'd have to have some sort of evidence that this group exists. And so far, the only evidence has come from uh, the, this manifesto that Ilya Panaryov wrote out on YouTube. And he showed about a three second clip of some guy uh, in you know camo and with some you know, bandana over his face and shades. You know, you could you can you know make out a single feature, uh, you know, speak speaking through some sort of uh, voice altering device and um you know it, it is true that there have been you know some people have uh, firebombed uh recruitment offices there have been some uh um there's been sabotage of, of railway supply lines and um uh other other things like that in in russia but but this particular group there's there's uh no no real uh reason you know at the moment to believe it exists because um we have on Mario, uh, is it's not exactly a trustworthy. You know, he's not really thought of as a trustworthy figure by you know even other members of the Russian opposition. He he was you know in 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 parliament for years. You know voting voting for uh, laws such as you know the Russian anti Magnitsky law, which uh, banned Americans from from adopting Russian orphans. He um, had close ties to Vladislav Serkov, who was uh, Putin's uh, politics impresario for for so many years. And then he 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 voted against the annexation of Crimea. You know, went to the well, he went to opposition and uh, eventually he left the country after he was accused of uh, very various financial crimes. And um, no, I thought I thought it was um, re- really telling see, seeing the reaction on Twitter just from other members of the Russian opposition uh, when when he said this, which was you, you, you could sort of boil it down to thinking, you know, if I was going to start some sort of partisan group and, you know, this this would not be the guy that I would choose to uh, tell tell people about it. You know, it only damages your credibility further. So, I mean, if we want to go into the realm of pure speculation, you know, one one argument I heard was uh, and and you know actually two and they're and they're, and they're both based on just pure conjecture. So you can you know take them with about equal number of grains of salt. Is uh, you know one it's you know like Dugan and his daughter you know not not uh, thought of in in Russia as you know particularly as influential figures necessarily as they are in the West and in Ukraine. Uh, Ilya Panamaryov you know he he lives in Ukraine he has uh, Ukrainian citizenship you know despite being a former Russian member of Parliament that obviously means you know he has some connections in in Ukraine you know might might this uh, look like a more logical thing to do from the Ukrainian point of view possibly but you know Ilya Panamaryov. Uh, also also has lot, lots of ties uh in in this past to to the Russian elite and uh there there are a lot of uh you know things about this don't add up that have led some people to think this some sort of Russian false like possibly again you know this this is why I I go back and say you know rather than you know you can you can spend all day doing this you know it was you know Colonel mustard in in the in the drawing room but you know with the candelabra I uh, while, while we don't have any real evidence and you know the FSB is in charge of this investigation uh it's only going to get you so far and I think what's much more uh important is 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 the reaction and the reaction is uh very much showing that the Putin and the Russian state uh are only going to if anything step up what they're doing to Ukraine you know, we've sort of talked about how th- this attack was one of the first times that the war has been felt in Moscow, certainly. Um, 
there have been a bunch of mysterious explosions, drone attacks, whatever, in Russian occupied Crimea, in the Crimean Peninsula, including places, you know, near where Russians were literally hanging out on the beach on vacation with their kids, with their families. Do you have a sense of whether uh, those attacks and what I imagine was considered a relatively safe area have have brought the war home in a different way for Russians or impacted that broader narrative about the war? I mean, I guess this would be in terms of like media coverage, discussions you're seeing on Telegram, et cetera. Oh, absolutely. I think I think um, there, you know, there was certainly feeling in Russia, especially with Crimea, you know, they completely got away with it. Uh, they, they'd have to fire a single shot, you know, when when they were taking over over the peninsula. Uh, yeah. And then, um, you know, Western countries didn't really do anything. The sanctions were really mild. Uh, just just a few sanctions against mem- personal sanctions against members of uh, the Russian elite compared to, you know, the much, much more significant ones that Russia is under is under now. And, you know, they were able to, you know, heavily, you know, Crimea was internationally isolated but they were able to link it to russia you know with with flights by by building this uh extremely complex uh you know complex uh feed of engineering this bridge that, that goes over the treacherous waters of the uh of the kirch strait you know built of course by one of putin's childhood buddies at a great expense and uh there there is a sort of uh you know feeling that you know they you know they won that you know people were going they were having a nice time on on the beach you know putin the friends were buying up all all the vineyards uh, on on Crimea, and uh, this this um you know very you know very much shattered that that illusion. So you uh, this this same bridge uh, you know the you know the traffic going out of it has been at record levels uh, since since uh, these these uh, things military targets in in Crimea started started blowing up, and uh, you know tourism in Crimea this year is down by I think half off the top of my head, which is partly because of the war it makes it more difficult to fly there. You know you have to sure, you have to sure. try it. But um, you know, this this is not exactly a great uh, advertisement for your Crimean beach holiday if uh, things are blowing up at the airbase uh, nearby. And um, also, it you know, it seems to have shown us that you know, Ukraine, you know, whatever these capabilities are, it's not entirely clear. You know, it could be missiles, drones, behind the line sabotage, some some combination of it. Uh, but uh, they they have some some pretty good capacities because you know some of these explosions in the places like Belbek Air Base near Sevastopol that's uh, about 300 kilometers uh, south of the closest Ukrainian position. So it's uh, certainly been impressive, and um, it, you, you get the impression that the Ukrainian government also really enjoy the the reaction too. Because as as best as I can tell, it's um, their version of what Russia did when when Russia seized Crimea and pretended for the first month or so that the little green men weren't really Russian Russian soldiers and yeah. which was just intensely irritating to everyone else because you know yeah, trolling was, yeah you, you could see it with your own eyes and so the Ukrainians you know whenever there's one of these explosions you'll see a bunch of senior officials in Zelensky's administration go on Twitter and uh, you know the joke is uh, oh because because um the, the thing for Russia is very embarrassing uh, to to admit that that Ukraine has been you know striking these targets and uh, there's also the risk of uh, you know providing in panic among the local population you get things like you know people leaving leaving crimea on on mass after you know the, these attacks ruined were in their beach vacation and uh so so rush for a long time they wouldn't use the word explosion in state media reports they just say some bangs or some claps and uh the the, the explanation would be oh there was some sort of fire safety violation you know the <laughs> munitions uh just just blew up by themselves and so, right, yep. so the ukrainians would say ah oh, uh, the Russians say, but smoking again. Uh, yeah. you know, the ammunition depot shouldn't do that. You know, smoking kills. And there's been a certain, um, you know, um, schadenfreude built up over eight years of occupation that, that the Ukrainians appear to be enjoying there. Yeah, it's some, uh, some dark, dry humor, but I, I agree with you. Sell your stock in Club Med Crimea. So l- last question here. Just, you know, this war has been going on for about six months. Winter is rapidly approaching. Lots of European countries, notably Germany, are extremely dependent on Russian natural gas, which Russia is slowly ramping down, cutting off. You know, there's all these maintenance efforts that suddenly have to happen where the Nord Stream 1 pipeline shuts down for several days, comes back up. It's at lower capacity level. Do you have a sense of... This is a big sort of big picture question. What European resolve is looking like in terms of support for Ukraine as the cost begins to literally be felt by ordinary people who might have to, you know, heat their house at a lower level or industries that you could imagine 
might actually have to fully shut down if there really is insufficient natural gas supplies. I was actually in Kiev, uh, you know, when when the Davos Forum happened, which was in uh, the end of May, and I remember when there was a moment where. Uh, the mood, uh, you know, suddenly took took a turn for the darker because in in Ukraine they'd uh, been very successful in you know, March and April at uh, driving Russia out of central Ukraine. They were getting more support from the West. There was this feeling that they'd be able to do that. Life was going back to normal in cities like Kiev, which itself, you know, after what happened in February, March felt to a lot of people like an act of defiance. And then a lot of Ukrainians uh, in the elite, they came back from Davos having met all these uh, you know, European uh, politicians and businessmen, you know, saying, and you'd see a few of them say these things publicly, uh, that they have a Volkswagen was one of them um, saying, oh, you know, we really want, you know, business, business as usual. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's something the Ukrainians are, are very much worried about. And that's something that Putin pretty, pretty much appears to be, to be counting on. So yeah. it, yeah. If, I mean, it's 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 like a game of chicken because you know that's something that you know Putin and and uh, the Kremlin have been saying a lot is that you know sanctions they are a two way street because you know in Europe you know especially in uh, Germany uh, you you had this um uh, this this policy of uh, you know energy. Uh, interdependence that uh a lot of people in the west they thought that this would um some you know somehow better russia and uh you know draw it closer together with europe in fact what it did it made uh europe extremely vulnerable to russia you know something that the russians very much know and uh, the uh, calculation in russia it, it appears to be you know that you know we you know we can take more these europeans are weak because uh they're you know these are democratic societies they have to explain to their voters uh every couple of years you know why the energy bill has has, has uh, gone up so much, uh, you know, especially, you know, somewhere, you know, like you know, in Latvia where I am, you have twenty percent infl- inflation right now. In uh, the UK, it's one of the few countries that isn't subsidizing these huge energy bills. So you're seeing a lot of small businesses, even you know, in the summer, already going out of business when they when they get hit with the bills. In the country that is you know relatively not very dependent on on, on Russian gas, and uh, I think that is very much what what Putin is 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 hoping for is that you know if you if you look at everything that Putin has has said and done, you know you. You don't do this, you know, for, you know, for a joke, like you don't do this unless you're extremely committed to, to the bit. It's the same with Dugan. You know, Dugan started out as this um, postmodernist, you know, everything that he would say would also contain its own denial. You know, half of it appeared to be a joke. You know, so much of it was just, you know, gibberish and trolling. Uh, but uh, he's, you know, he, yeah, he's really become, you know, committed to, to the bit like you, you know. Yeah, he's a homicidal maniac. Yes. And, and I think Putin is uh, not unreasonably thinking that you know he has um stronger stronger resolve than all these people he he uh doesn't doesn't really seem to respect uh uh most most uh european leaders and uh, he thinks that he can he can outlast them you know he's already been there for 22 years why should he stop now yeah understandable um max great to see you thank you as always everyone should read your stuff at the financial times everyone should follow you on twitter you're a great follow just want everyone to know that and uh, i really appreciate it all right again thanks so much thanks again to max for joining the show Always a great, uh, the guy knows a lot about yes. Russia, yeah. the ultranationalists. Yes. His head lived in dark spaces. He really helped us, like, at the outset of the war, like, and just, he, he was right. Everything he said about, like, Putin's mindset in the run-up to the war and, you know, I think Max has got his finger on the pulse. I, I do, say. too, in part because it seems like he was reading a lot of, like, Alexander Dugan philosophy and you know that he knew i think he goes deep thinkers yeah. were yeah he goes into it it's pretty it's, there's some it's interesting to like look at the intellectual underpinnings of putin such as they are you know yeah. it's kind of uh interesting as one word adjacent terrifying uh, is another thanks to um santa marin and uh, thanks to the guy who wrote the review of the jared Kushner oh, book you're the yeah. best um, everybody was, should google that i think his name is dwight garner yeah you should check it out check it out i i was disappointed to see jared at number one on amazon <laughs> Um, if you've yeah. made it this far, you you can pick up my book and you know make a little knock him off. Yeah. Don't don't we think that Jared paid somebody to buy a bunch yes. of bulk ones There's, on Amazon? I am a hundred percent certain that Jared had people buying like thousands of copies of his book. Yeah, me too. Because yeah. who else is? I mean, th- that that review made the point. Like, who's this book for? Like, who are the Jared stands? He's not like the MAGA people really like Jared. You know? Trump ain't reading this thing. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Ivanka's, <laughs> Ivanka's reading this. Ivanka's not reading this thing. Don and Eric. Yeah can barely read probably nobody is reading this who no. doesn't have to read it for their job no, no yeah. absolutely not uh, all right that's it for this week talk to you soon see ya